Experiment 13, Determination of Solution Concentration via Titration, works incredibly well. No anomalous, wacky results like the pH lab. This lab works incredibly well and we'll be able to determine the percent of acid in a solution of vinegar, which you might have at home in salad dressing and so on and so forth. It's well known that vinegar, vinegar is 5% by volume acetic acid. And we're going to be able to confirm that in this lab. So here we go. Uh, it says take 30 milliliters of vinegar and add it to 100 milliliter beaker and then take 10 milliliters uh, into three uh, Erlenmeyer flasks. We can, uh, since I'm the only one doing this today in here, we can go straight to the pipetting 10 milliliters into three Erlenmeyer flasks. Uh, we're just going to do the experiment three times to make sure that we can confirm our result, which we learned in the pH lab can be pretty important. So cap up like usual. And I'm going to use a volumetric pipette, which this one is interesting. It has on it both a TC, focus, let's see if I can give the camera something to focus on. It has both a TC and a TD line, just not going to focus. Um, most pipettes just are TD. So that's the line that we're going to use because we want to deliver 10 milliliters. And on here, it should say somewhere what it's plus or minus. It's usually 0 0.02 milliliters. Yeah, it's on there, but it'll be impossible to read on the camera. I'll try and show it to you anyway. Plus or minus 0 0.02 milliliters. So very, very, very precise measuring device. We can't just pour 10 milliliters in here. It's not going to work. So the way that we do it is to use a pipette bulb. And these things can get destroyed very easily for, from people not knowing how to use them properly. And uh, it's pretty much uh, relatively straightforward to use. The old school ones uh, had no valves on them, that, and that's what breaks on these. It was just a rubber bulb, and you, you squeezed it to suck the air out, uh, to blow the air out of it, and then it would suck stuff up in it. Um, old school way of pipetting, um, there was a little hose and a mouthpiece that came, and you shoved the hose on the end of here, and then you just put the other end in your mouth and you sucked it up. Um, that is generally considered to be uh, a big, big, big no-no in the lab today. Never, never suck anything up in the lab and certainly never put your mouth on there and try and suck it up. That's, that's bad news. So you're going to use your pipette bulb. The valves on here, whichever valve you squeeze, that's where the air can come out. So the air can come out the top that way. And now it's ready to suck stuff in. If I squeeze this valve right here, that will suck air up in that way. And if I were to squeeze this valve, that lets air in that way which would allow the pipette to drain. Uh, I kind of am halfway old school using the, the, this type of pipette bulb. I like to suck it up with the bulb, and then I like to put my finger on the top of it to uh, get it exactly on the line and let it drain out. You can use the bulb to let the water out. Uh, it's just not the way that I'm comfortable with. So you want to put this on gently, because if you shove it in there, you'll blow the valve to pieces. There's a little ball bearing in there that doesn't. And uh, we know that our pipette is clean, and so that's the only reason that we can go directly into our stock solution bottle. We would not want to contaminate this bottle. Uh, so the reason that it says pour uh, around 30 milliliters of acid into 100 milliliter beakers is we don't want this bottle contaminated. I am not contaminating it. I know that my pipette is clean. And so I'm going to go squeezing the top valve to let the liquid suck up into it. And I'm going to let the liquid go in past the line. See it in a second. There it is. But I'm not going to let the liquid get sucked up into the bulb. I've gone past the line, which is down here, but not into the bulb, because that would trash the bulb. I didn't let any air bubbles get in. So now, do we use the, the pipette way of doing it. I'll press the side valve to let the liquid drain out until the meniscus is exactly on the line, the TD line, which is the top line on this one. Exactly on the line. Carefully take it out, no letting any air bubbles in, no letting anything out, and into the first Flask. This is TD to deliver. I'm letting it drain on its own. 
I touch it to the side of the flask to get anything off of the tip. But there is, in the pipette, you can see, a small amount remaining. It has delivered the 10.00 milliliters plus or minus 0 0.02 milliliters exactly. There's no bulge, nothing hanging off the tip. This is exactly delivered 10 milliliters. Now, there's a drop on the outside from where I had it in the vinegar. Just clean that off with a paper towel to see if there's anything on the inside. And in fact, there is, okay? There's drops of vinegar inside the pipette. That is not supposed to happen. It has not delivered 10.00 milliliters. This pipette needs to be thrown away. However, it's a nice way of us explaining any error that we get at the end of the lab, so I'm gonna keep using it, okay? You wanna look for opportunities where things that have gone wrong in the lab can be explained. We haven't delivered exactly 10 milliliters, which is the whole point of using this pipette, is so that we exactly deliver 10 milliliters. It is what it is. So that's flask number one, done. We'll do that again with flasks number two and three. Gently on, suck up, past the TD line, but not into the bulb, which would contaminate everything. I'm gonna go old school this way and use my finger to get down to the line. Removing that bulb and getting my finger on the top, sort of skillful, <laughs> practice, takes a little practice. And then all I do is kind of rotate my thumb off the top of it a little bit so that I can even more slowly than with the, with the, uh, uh, pipette bulb, I can get the meniscus exactly on the TV line, which again, on most pipettes, there is only one line, so that's the line you'd be going for, because most pipettes are just marked TV. Meniscus is exactly on the line, then I can put my finger over the top, maybe I'll wipe off the outside beforehand this time, and drain into the second Perlmeyer flask. Drained on its own, I touch it to the side, get that last drop off the tip, but again, there is a little bit in the tip that is calibrated for and designed for. There are, again, drops inside the neck, not calibrated for, not supposed to happen. That's two of three. Three of three. And pass the line. If I got an air bubble or something in there, I would just let it drain out and start over again. Again, I get back down to eye level, rotate my thumb off very, very, very slightly, to move the meniscus down incredibly slowly until it's exactly on the line. I'm done. Wipe off the outside just in case there's anything goofy going on and let it drain on its own into Erlenmeyer flask number three. So, to answer the question in the book, why is it necessary to use this pipette instead of a beaker or a flask or even a graduated cylinder? The answer is because this is plus or minus 0 0.02 milliliters plus or minus 5%, like a beaker, and then a graduated cylinder, even a good one. Let's take the 10 milliliter graduated cylinder and remind ourselves what it says on it. Plus or minus, doesn't say, I'm pretty sure this is plus or minus 0.2 milliliters, plus or minus 0 0.02 milliliters, a order of magnitude, one decimal place, more precise. Now, yeah, this one is old, and so it had droplets adhering to the inside, which is not good, but it's still more precise than this, which is infinitely more precise than this. Step three, we're recording 10 milliliters as our volume of acid used, because we did. We had 10 milliliters, 10 milliliters, 10 milliliters in each of these three flasks. So there's nothing different about the flask, and that's why we didn't need to renumber them or number them at all. Just getting a drop that was on the sides wash it down in there, but we'll carefully do this anyway as we go along. So we have three flasks. The next step, we're going to add about 10 milliliters of deionized water to each of the flasks. How come? 
because we want to just have a decent volume in there. And 10 milliliters can be a little bit challenging. So I can use my, grad, my uh, deionized water bottle to rinse down the sides of my flask. To rinse down the sides of the flask. Am I measuring the 10 milliliters? I'm not even bothering because at about 10 milliliters of water. It doesn't matter how much water we add. We added 10 milliliters of vinegar exactly. And that's what we're interested in because the amount of acid that's in there is the amount of acid that's in there. Assuming that our deionized water is in fact this week deionized. The water isn't changing the amount of acid present. We have 10 milliliters of vinegar. It has a certain amount of acid in it that we're trying to measure through this titration. And that amount of acid is already in there. Adding extra water, as long as it's deionized, isn't affecting anything. All right, we're going to add an indicator because we absolutely need an indicator. Just like in the pH lab, other than the pH meter, everything changed color for us to be able to determine the pH. So same thing here. We got to have some way of telling when all of the acid in our vinegar flasks has reacted with the base that we're going to put into our purette. So the indicator that we use is called phenolphthalein, which is a solid uh, that was dissolved in some water here. Did they spell it right on the bottle? They did. It looks like phenolphthalein. But it's pronounced phenolphthalein. And we'll put in one, two, three drops. One, two, three drops. One, two, three drops. Why do I only add three drops? Because acid base indicators are themselves acids or bases. And so if I add a whole ton of indicator there, I'm adding extra acid. The question in the book says, what happens if you forget to add the indicator? Well, actually, the second question was, and what is the harm in adding more than two drops of indicator? I already answered that one. But the first question, what happens if you forget to add the indicator? No color change. You can't tell when the acid has reacted with the base. Why do you not add more than two or three drops of indicator? Because it's an acid. That's how it, ch it changes color. When its H plus comes off of it as an acid, that's when it changes color. And so if you add a whole bunch of extra indicator, you end up with a whole bunch of extra acid and that messes with your reaction. Step six, we have clamped a burette. Long glass tube with a valve at the end, which is marked from zero at the top to 25 at the bottom milliliters. It's in the 10th of a milliliter increments. So 20. D, 20.1, 20.2, 20.3, etc. as we go down. So that means that we have to record our data to the hundredth place, because if I just write down 20.2 milliliters as my reading, right here, 20.2 milliliters, then that is assuming that I have guessed the 0.2, that it was somewhere between 20 and 30, but closer to 20, and I guessed 20.2. Excuse me, somewhere between 20 and 21, and I guess the 0.2. On here, I'll be able to tell, is it between 20.1 and 20.2? And I have to guess the hundredths place. Okay? Step seven, use a funnel to carefully fill the burette with an aqueous 0.5 molar NaOH solution. I have aqueous sodium hydroxide 0.5 molar solution. I have a funnel. And I'm going to put it in the top. Did you guys see that? Which is a little bit over my head, which is kind of dangerous. So I'm going to bring it down as low as I can. If I couldn't get it down any lower, because the fact that was, uh, the burette was longer, I would get a step stool and climb up. I'm going to rinse my burette with some uh, sodium hydroxide, uh, just because it hasn't been used in a while. So here we go. I'm just going to add a couple of milliliters. This is not in the lab manual, but I want to do it just to be safe. The valve is off. Whichever way the handle faces is the way that the hole is. So the hole is that way. No liquid can come out. So I'm just going to put my finger over the end and really coat the inside 
of the urette with the base. Now I'm going to trash this base now that I'm confident that my glassware is clean. So, just a waste speaker. And I let the base almost all the way drain out. Yeah, I might as well let it drain all the way out. Why not? Okay. If I have any air in this tip, once I've filled it, not allowed. Again, I'm going to fill it with base. It says don't waste your time filling it exactly to the zero mark with base because there's no reason for that. I'm getting it where there's no air down in the tip because if there were air in the tip, then when I turn the valve on, some of it will be filling the tip, not draining into my reaction. So I need to make sure that I don't waste the function of the burette. The burette, like that pipette before, is a very, very, very precise measuring device. This is uh, to deliver at 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, I'm looking for a plus minus on it. doesn't have one, but it's, again, usually like 0 0.02 of a milliliter. Since it reads in 0.1s of a milliliter, you can, and you're guessing that last digit, yeah, pretty much plus or minus 0 0.02 or 0 0.03 milliliters. Very, very, very precision volume measuring. So I'm going to put a uh, white piece of paper underneath the flask when I go to start my reaction. Just got a paper towel here. Okay, waste beaker is there. Now, I need to get a good starting reading of my volume. So, I need to look really, really carefully, maybe get a piece of paper with a line on it for behind my, uh, my burette. Get my eye level right at the liquid, which is right here. You can even see it on the camera. And this is somewhere between three and four milliliters. And it actually, it's between 3.0 and 3.1. You know what? Actually, I think it's exactly on the 3.0 line. Yeah not between 3.0 and 3.1, it's exactly on the 3.0 line. And what that means is, it's not 3.0 or 3.1, it's exactly on the 3.0 at 3.00. Okay, I have to record that extra decimal place. It reads in tenths, I have to record to the hundredths. This is 3.00 milliliters is my starting value. Move this closer where we, you can see it see all the action. First flask underneath. Notice the tip is into the flask so that as I'm swirling it around, I don't accidentally miss a drop. Now you could put a stirrer, a stirring bar in here and put this on top of a magnetic stirrer and have it stir for you, but let's go old school. All right. It says in step 10, after, well, there's a question first, why is a good lab technique to remove the funnel? took the funnel out after I filled it, 3.00 milliliters. How come I took it out? Well, because if there's a drip or something in the funnel and it drips down into my burette as I'm titrating, I just trashed the whole point of using a burette. Remember, plus or minus 0.2 milliliters and a drop, 20 drops per milliliter is 0 0.5, uh, 0.05 of a milliliter. You're trashing your precision. There's no reason to do that. So take the funnel out so it doesn't drip in. Why do we use a white sheet of paper? So that we can see when our indicator changes color. All right, we have no idea where this is going to change color the first time. When we do number two and number three, we will know because we will have done it once. 
right? We'll know how many milliliters it takes. So we're starting at 3.00, and we're going to add uh, some base. Now, I am paranoid just from back in the day uh, when these things used to not be made out of silicone. They were uh, made out of glass, and occasionally they would pop off, and then everything would go all over the table. It was annoying. So I like to hang on to both sides at once, but this doesn't give you a hand to stir with, so uh, I can get it going. You might be able to see right as it hits, it turns pink, because locally, all the acid in the base have reacted, but not globally. So I've got it dripping out. Again, I don't know how much this is going to take. Patience. See, it turned pink up here. There's a drip up there that's very, very pink, because up there, all the acid is reacted with all the base, but I'm just going to drip it down the sides as I go. It can do this also with deionized water. Hit this thing, I bet, excuse me, the burette as it drips. Also rinse down my sides as it goes. Again, the amount of water doesn't matter because there's already the amount of H pluses in there from the vinegar as they're going to be in there. Again, patience is required here. It's staying pink a little bit longer, but notice when I swirl, it goes away. We are at 14 now, which means we've added 11 milliliters. Our goal is the lightest shade of pink possible, thus the white paper, that persists. Maybe you won't get it the first time. That's why we're doing it the second time and the third time. Stay in pink a little bit longer as I swirl it, but it's not staying pink. Maybe it's gonna stay. Nope. We use a flask also instead of a beaker so that it doesn't splash and escape. I'll give you an extra close up on the next one. Just want you to see all the action on this first one. It's staying pink a little longer, at least locally where the drop is hitting, but it's not staying permanently. It's got to persist for at least 30 seconds. You want to say 30 seconds because if you leave it long enough, if you leave it longer than 30 seconds, it can, uh, it can sometimes turn back colorless because of, again, carbon dioxide in the air reacting to form carbonic acid and uh, it'll turn back colorless. Uh, not that I recommend this, but it's entirely possible. If you take a drinking straw, one that you know is clean and you shouldn't have anything in your mouth in the lab, but if you get a clean drinking straw and you blow into this after it's turned pink, it will absolutely turn back colorless because of the carbon dioxide in your breath forming carbonic acid and reacting in the solution. Oop, there we go. One drop made it pink and stay pink. And I'm just going to confirm by adding, rinsing down the sides with deionized water, that in fact it is pink and staying pink. That might have even been one drop too many. So now I got to get my final reading. I started at 3.00. I'm going to get down here. It's kind of the clamp is in the way. So I'm between 26, no, I'm between 20 and 21. I'm between 20.1, 2, 3, Four, I'm between 20.3 and 20.4, but really, really, really close to 20.4. So I'm going to call this 20.39. 20.39. Yes, 20.39. So minus the three, we're at 17.39 milliliters. 17.39 milliliters, knowing that is going to make it a lot easier the second time around. And it took me 17 milliliters, 17.39 milliliters. All right, so we're good, we're away. Again, if I took a drinking straw and blew into the solution, it would turn back colorless because of carbon dioxide in the air. We'll see if it turns back colorless by the end of my 
other two titrations. All right, I need to refill. I do not refill with experiment number two underneath it. In case I overflow, it would drip in here and ruin it. So put my waste beaker underneath. I need to refill because I don't have 17 milliliters left. I'm at 20 point whatever, and I will have, uh, it only goes to 25, so it'll run out. So I add another whatever number of milliliters. See, it's good I didn't have that flask under there. I had a drip. Okay, and another one. So here we go. I need my initial value as I'm starting here. So I don't have to worry about my tip. It's still good from last time. Taking out my funnel, as always. And I'm going to get my initial reading, which is between 20 point, let's see, no, it's between 2.5 and 2.6. 2.59. Yeah, 2.59 is my starting value the second time around. 2.59. See if I can give you. It's going to be challenging. There's the meniscus. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be any way for you to tell, but I'll try. Give that to you. 2.59. And now, flask number two in. Valve. On for 17 milliliters, right? This is a little over 17. So instead of 2.59, I got to go to 19 point something, so I can just let her rip. Full blast. 18, just in case. I'm slowing down at 18. Now, swirl, 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 swirl. Still colorless, as expected for not quite adding the right amount. Now let's see if I can really this time get it done with one drop to turn it from clear, colorless, to clear and pink. So we'll do one drop at a time, very slow. Ooh, see that drop went on the edge there? I have to wash that down. In fact, let's wash that down now just to be safe. Okay, I washed it into the flask with my wash bottle. Rinse off the tip too. Here we go. Let's get this in so that we're certain to not miss. One drop. Two drops. Three drops. Four drops. Third drop did it, didn't it? Lightest shade of pink possible. Double check, rinse down the side of the flask. Just make sure everything is washed down in. Definitely still pink. I need my final reading, again, in the way. And as expected, it's between 19 and 20. It's actually between 19 Point eight and nineteen point nine. Don't know that you'll be able to see this one. 
19.8 and 19.9, but really, 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 really close to 19.9. And so I'm going to call it 19.89. 1989. Good year. College, 1989. All right? So that's two of three. So we went from whatever the value was I said before to 19.89. As expected. It took about 17 milliliters. Again, I need to refill. So I'll put my waste bottle underneath. I'll put my funnel back in. I'm going to lower it down so that it's as close to not pouring over my head as possible. And fill her up. Whoop! I actually did overshoot that time. There's still some left in the funnel, so I'm going to turn it on, let it drain out, and there we go. Make sure there's nothing on the outside of my burette that's going to drip into my experiment. Again, I'm not wasting my time starting it at 0.00. .00. That is an enormous waste of time. So many people, oh, I don't want to have to subtract. And then they spend five minutes getting it exactly on 0.00. .00. Just use a calculator and subtract for crying out loud. We're starting this time at 2.39. It's really, really close to the 2.4. 2.39. 2.39. Yep. Two and three nine. All right. Away with the waste bottle. In with experiment number three. I know that it's going to take about 17 milliliters, so I'm going to go rapidly up to 18 again. Just putting my finger on it so that I know where to stop. And I'll just let her rip. Now you might think, oh my god, it turned pink. You missed it. Awful. But look at that. Science doesn't lie. Data can be misrepresented, but ex chemistry is a chemistry. I, I knew how much was going to be in there based on my first two titrations. So now I can go really, really carefully at the end, just like I did last time. So I'll get it going a drop at a time, a little slower than that. Lower it down in so the tip is in there for sure. It's turning pink, but it's going away. It's turning pink, but it's going away. I am not going too far. I want one drop to turn it pink. And that's it. Oh, did I stop it exactly right? I think I might have. Rinse down the tip just to be safe. Oh, it turned a little bit darker. You know what? I may have gone one drop too far, which begs the question after step 10, what is the effect on my result if I add too much base? Now, this is going to be uh, requiring some initial dis uh, additional discussion, perhaps, with your instructor. But if I have too much base added, then it would appear that there's more acid in here that it reacted with, right? If it takes, let's use round numbers, 20 milliliters of base to react with the acid. But that was, I added extra. I, I missed it. I didn't add too much. It was only supposed to be 19. Well, the molarity of this 0.5 molar Molarity, 0.5 molar, times the 20 milliliters is going to give me a certain number of moles versus the molarity times 19 milliliters that it should have been, let's say, is going to be a lesser number of moles. And since the number of moles of base is exactly the same as the number of moles of acid, we're assuming when it's all finished reacting, then it was, if I add too much base, it's as if I had more acid to start with. And that's going to give me a higher percentage of vin uh, acid in the vinegar. So again, ways of explaining any error. Now, if you've got a lower percentage of, uh, of uh, acid in the vinegar than would be expected, lower than 5%, you're going to have to do a little bit of thinking about that. Right? What could require you to add extra, uh, or, or excuse me, add less base? I don't know about that. that that's going to be a tough one. Because uh, then we start to get in errors with this bottle. And you really can't blame stuff on the stock room. That's, that's a bad idea. Oh, the stock room didn't make up the 0.5 molar base. 
that's true. It's possible they messed up, but you might as well just blame it. Uh, what I always say is, you might as well blame an error like that on a monkey coming into the lab and pooping in the flask. That could have happened. It's highly unlikely, but it could have happened. So rabid monkeys pooping in flasks, to me, that's the same kind of uh, thing as saying, well, the stockroom didn't make this solution wrong. They, they're paid to do their job. They should have done it right. Now, does base react with a glass? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So maybe this base is not as strong as it's supposed to be because it reacted with the glass. That's not the stockroom's fault. That's just science. So if this is less than 0.5 molar because of it reacting with the glass, then it might have taken uh, you know, apparently more of it to react and give you the, uh, a change in your result. But I'll leave you to discuss that with your instructor. So make sure that your volumes have all been recorded properly. Did I give you a final value on this one? I don't remember if I did or I didn't, but I'm pretty sure I did. Um, if not, let's double check it and see. Uh, this is at 19.672. 19.72 is our final reading on here. 19. Point, wait a minute, just checking my li number of lines. Uh, nine, yeah, nine, yeah. Yeah, 19.72 is our final volume reading on this. And do your calculations. And that is that. You have successfully figured out the percent by mass to volume of acetic acid in vinegar once you finish your calculations.